Welcome to Aerial Services LiDAR 101, webinar number one of three in Aerial Services Summer Webinar Series. This is your host, Joshua McNary, Marketing Manager at Aerial Services. We are pleased that you have joined us and hope you walk away having learned more about how LiDAR can help you with your geospatial projects. I'm now pleased to introduce my colleague and friend, Aerial Services Director of Business Development, Chuck Boyer, who will be sharing his LiDAR knowledge with you today. Chuck has over 15 years of successful experience in consulting and customer service. Before becoming the Director of Business Development, he was a top regional sales manager for a prominent geospatial solutions provider using LiDAR technology. Prior to that, he had been recognized as a top channel partner manager at a major computing company. He was hired by Aerial Services because he can build long-lasting relationships, exudes professionalism, has integrity, and knows what it takes to get the most out of LiDAR. So without further ado, I'll pass the baton to Chuck. Thanks, Josh. This is, um, this is really exciting that we're being able to have these webinars. If, like Josh said, if you have any questions, go ahead and write the questions down, then we'll answer as many as we can. If we don't have the uh, technical answer, we've got the phone numbers and we can get a hold of the people that we need to talk to. Aerial Services is a wonderful company um, sitting in the heartland of Cedar Falls, Iowa. We've been in business for 45 years and we're able to take care of all of your mapping needs. We can do the aerial photography, the aerial mapping and LIDAR. We can work in geographic uh, information systems. The 45 years of experience that we have shows our longevity. And we do uh, have our aircrafts headquartered out of Waverly, Iowa. But really what we do, we make maps. We take the leading technology. We use our experience that we've gained over millions of miles of projects, and we provide you with customer service. And in that customer service, aerial service has changed, but really survey and mapping, they're just tools. They're things that are constantly changing, and how are you able to keep up with the changes? The evolution took place when they started using something like Champlain's Astrolab. Then they went to a theodolite in the 1800s. Then they would have used a surveyor's transit in the 1950s then to a total station in the 1980s. Then they came up with this newfangled thing called GPS. GPS, if you would have gone up to a surveyor and said, I want you to try this, it's brand new, but I, I still want you to use it, they would have told you, no, I can't do it. It's going to cost more money. It's not as efficient. It's not as effective. I just won't do that to my customer. Now if you go up to that same surveyor today and say, I want to take away the GPS, they're going to say the same excuses. It would cost money. I'm not going to be as accurate. It's going to involve more time than I'm going to want to use. Aerial photo has been the same way. In the 1930s, we started aerial photo by a guy hanging out of a camera, out of an airplane with a camera. Now we can do 50 centimeter accuracy on uh, on satellites. So aerial imagery has changed as well. And now we come up with this newfangled thing called LIDAR. So we get topography over the years through either ground survey, either leveling, total station, or GPS. We've gone through photogrammetric compilation using stereo plotters and soft copy photogrammetry, and now LIDAR. It's an acronym for light detection and ranging. LIDAR is just another tool in your toolbox for obtaining that typographical detail. But a lot of people want to know, well, just Chuck, can you explain to me what LIDAR is? We start in an aircraft, either a helicopter or a fixed-wing aircraft. You can even use LIDAR on the ground. Um, it uses basic ranging technology that's been around for a long time, about 20 years. It combines a couple of sciences and brings together LIDAR. You just take the aircraft, you have GPS in the aircraft, you have GPS in the ground, you have an IMU or INS, the IMU is an inertial measurement unit for roll, pitch, and yaw, the GPS 
does X, Y, and Z. And so now we're able to detect where it is. We know how high the aircraft is above the ground level. We know how wide it's swath. We can shoot a beam. And then we're able to, with our sensor, able to put up to uh, 300,000 points on the ground per second. We use a rotating polygon mirror with our Regal VQ480, and it just measures scan time and gap time. The pulses are then put out in a particular path, puts a regular grid on the ground of points, and then we're able to pick up the returns. Now with those returns, some LIDAR sensors are able to pick up first return, some are able to pick up last return, some are able to pick up first and last with our sensor. It's a full wave scanner, so we can pick up multiple points, which is why we're able to get such an accurate assessment of the ground. But it's just measuring those pulses that it goes out, and then every time it hits something, we're going to get a return from it. When you look at different data points, we're collecting the XYZ. We can look at just the top view, which would be the digital canopy model. We can take that LIDAR make it a side view. We can see if we can penetrate through the trees. On LIDAR, we'll classify everything, but we're not going to edit anything because you can see where those blue lines start and then there's a big gap and then it starts again. I'm not going to connect those dots because I don't know that there isn't a 10-foot pit there in this particular case because of what I see around. I'm pretty sure that that's a tree there. There's some collection differences, the way that people collect data. You've got people that will collect one-foot contours and two-foot contours as an accuracy. Some people will say three to four points per meter is one-foot contours. Other people say, I can do it with one point per meter. They're trying to do that because they're making the point count lower in the ground. They fly higher. They fly a wider swath to reduce the cost, but at what cost to you as a customer? They're also reducing the quality. You may be able to do one point per meter and get one foot contour accuracy if you're only measuring something like the uh, salt flats in Nevada. Some people will say I can do two foot contours at one to two points per meter. Other people will say I can do it at one point every two meters. The same thing holds true. It's just not going to be as accurate assessment. Another big difference when people collect LIDAR, some people will do 10% overlap and then trim the edges. Other people will do a 50% overlap for 100% coverage. You really want the 50% overlap for the 100% coverage, depending on the project, because if you're doing an urban area and you only fly one side of the building, you've got a forward shooting uh, sensor it's only going to collect the front part of the building without collecting any part of the back end of the building. When you collect LIDAR, the excellent thing about it is that you get millions of points and then you use them when you need them. It's like looking at an onion. The LIDAR process just takes flying the LIDAR, collecting the data, processing the X, Y, and Z points. You classify all the points. So you've got ground layer of points and above ground layers. And the above ground layers would be something like trees, buildings, towers, power lines, water bodies, things like that, anything man-made. And then you create the digital elevation model, or a DEM. You can create contours as a deliverable. You can collect vectors. You can deliver a fly-through or any other kind of product. A question that I get asked a lot is, can LIDAR see through trees? There used to be two seasons for LIDAR. There was leaf on and leaf off. Um, when they were using 20 kilohertz sensors, it was difficult because they were only putting out 20,000 points versus now with our sensor at 300,000 points. It was difficult to penetrate the canopy. Right now with our sensor, if I'm looking, I'm in the forest, I look up, if I can see sky, I can penetrate the canopy. You've just got pulses going through the trees, the branches, before they hit the ground you'll be able to collect not only the canopy, but also on the ground. I've done projects with Army Corps of Engineers, and they were trying to see the river flow and how everything fed into the tributaries. With the project, we were able to fly it in August 
that would have been considered leaf on, and I was able to do a, just a bang up job for the core. What you really want to make sure that you're able to map is anything underneath the canopy. So you want to be able to get a high point density, you want a large overlap, you want multiple returns, and then some kind of profiling system to make sure that you've got the higher density for fill-in. You want to make sure that you're able to see through trees. There's been a lot of talk um, in the orthophoto industry saying that orthophoto may replace LIDAR. I've never been able to hear anybody discuss that they could take an image to bare earth with orthophotos like you can with LIDAR. I think that they're great technologies, but again, they're both just tools in the toolkit. What kind of project are you doing? What do you need to do? What kind of outcome are you looking for? If you need something taken to bare earth, then you really do need LIDAR. In looking at this image, you're able to see the tributaries and how they flow into rivers. You're able to see the streams. You're able to see everything that in the forest it would uncover. As you can see in the upper right-hand side of the left-hand image, there are buildings there. As I go back and forth, you'll be able to see where LIDAR can take those buildings, anything man-made, and take it away. What LIDAR can do is provide you that point cloud of data. You get millions of points per square mile. LIDAR is fast, it's accurate. We can do really up to 35 square miles an hour. I can give anywhere from one inch accuracy on hard surfaces on up just depending on the collection parameters. My collection is fast, it's easy. I can map through canopy. With LIDAR, I'm not worried about time of day that I fly and I'm not worried about anything except weather. If it's cloudy, with our LiDAR sensor, we can just go underneath the clouds and start um, recalibrating and flying. With some sensors, you actually have to land the aircraft. And if you're two hours away and clouds roll in, that's not going to be cost effective for what you're trying to do. With me, I just drop 90 seconds, I'm flying again. So I can fly in day or night, like with um, orthophotos, the optimum time for the sun angle is between 10 and 2 o'clock. If you're doing a project where the, a lot of clouds roll in, you can start flying at 5 o'clock in the morning to a four-hour mission, and you're done before 10 o'clock. It delivers a really a diverse set of project products. You can do the full feature that I talked about, the bare earth. You can do contours as a deliverable. We can do building footprints, vectorization. I can do land usage transportation, utility corridors. I can also do any kind of oil sands, mining, different things like that. And a lot of people want to know, Chuck, can LIDAR see through everything? And the answer is no. There are two types of LIDAR. There's the LIDAR that uses a red beam laser like we use, and then there's bathymetric LIDAR. Bathymetric LIDAR uses two beams, uh, typically a blue and a green beam. That LIDAR one beam hits the surface of the water, the other beam is going to penetrate two to four times as deep as you can see. So if you're in St. Thomas at the beaches, you can see 20 feet down, then you're going to be able to do 40 uh, feet or deeper. If you're talking about the Gulf of Mexico, if you can see two inches, then four inches isn't really deep. It just depends on what you're trying to do. And you have to realize that some surfaces are not very good reflectors. I know that still water isn't a, uh, a good reflector. Pristine, very clean oil is not a very good reflector. Asphalt, coal, other kind of dark materials, um, they're not reflective. But I, I was told by uh, one engineer that beer foam was 90% reflective. So in case you ever need to, uh, to do that in the LIDAR, you would be able to. Um, it's really not an issue with what you're trying to collect. Um, it's more a limitation of the optics, not in LIDAR. The big thing that people want to talk about is LIDAR accuracy. I had a boss 
one time saying that he thought he flew the first LIDAR mission, and he thought he was going to have to spend his entire career taking the lie out of LIDAR. Because early on, when they had 20 kilohertz sensors, people were over committing and then under producing, and LIDAR kind of got a bad rap um, in 1996, 97, 98. But now the sensors are more powerful. They're able to collect faster, more accurate data. With our systems, our absolute vertical accuracy, I can collect anywhere from 1 to 3 inch on a hard surface, 2 to 12 inch, or a soft, vegetated, like a rolling terrain, and anywhere from 5 to 15 inches on a more hilly terrain. The absolute horizontal accuracy is going to be anywhere from 3 to 30 inch, and that really depends on the slope of the land. The real big key advantages of using LIDAR is that LIDAR is cost effective. You can collect a lot of data. You get fast results. Nobody has to impact the environment. Nobody really needs to go on anybody's property to be able to collect all this. So I can collect in a heavily forested area or an area that you may not be able to get to on foot. I can collect it out of a helicopter or an airplane. The, uh, the decrease in man hours in a field is so great that it reduces not only safety risk, but you get complete and accurate data sets. You don't have to worry about the restriction or obstruction or intrusive surveys. You don't have to worry about going on to Farmer Jones' land and questioning whether he's going to shoot you because you're on there doing a survey. And I'm not time of year dependent. I can collect in spring, fall, summer, winter. It doesn't matter. And the benefits, I get great speed. I get complete data sets. So oftentimes with a project, it's not just one entity that needs the data. If you're an oil and gas company, you may need the survey of the data, but then you're going to be able to give the data to environmental. You'll be able to give it to the pipeline people. You'll be able to give it into community activist groups. And all of these people, you don't have to send anybody out for a subsequent survey. The data can be used by the different departments. And then you get an all-digital product that's all georeferenced. It is a rapid collection of data. You can collect a lot of data in a relatively short period of time, processing it, reduce cost. There's fewer man days, less risk of accident. So there isn't a safer, more effective way to collect data than using LIDAR. And then you can drive a bunch of different products from one single data set. I did a, a pipeline project for an oil and gas company. From the time we were able to mobilize to the time we were able to deliver data was about 17 days from the time the contracts got signed. All of LIDAR collection and delivery is all weather contingent, though. So if there's a storm for 30 days, it's difficult to collect the data. But that would be so collecting with any kind of uh, survey methods. On this particular project, if they wanted one foot contours as an accuracy, it was going to cost about $120,000. Two foot contours, $110,000. We could do either 8-inch or 15-inch pixels, use preliminary ground survey for control, and the project was around $305,000, and we were able to deliver in six to nine weeks. If they would have done the same project with just traditional ground survey, no LIDAR, no photo, it would have cost about $1.1 million, and it would have taken 20 weeks to deliver. That's all in the front end. But with this company, they were able to find that they had other needs for the data other than just the surveying of the data. Those other divisions within the company, the entities within the entity, all needed data. They didn't have to send anybody out. So this company was able to save on the back end about $2.6 million over what it would have been using traditional survey because you get millions of points. And then the data products that you're able to deliver are really good. What you're collecting is going to be the X, Y, and Z points with LIDAR. You can do LIDAR quarter products where you collect just the, or deliver just the last point. You can do a shaded relief. You can do a complete digital elevation model. You can do contours as a deliverable. 
you can deliver in all points hillshade, either full feature or in a bare earth. And these are all in a GeoTIFF format. As far as orthophotos, we can do anything from 3-inch pixel resolution or greater on up. It just depends on the accuracy that you're looking for. With the contours, there's two different types of contours. There's contours derived from LIDAR and then something that people are used to seeing when they're using orthophoto. The LIDAR contours are more accurate, but they give you jagged edges. So customers may not be accustomed to seeing the LIDAR contours and think, well, that looks really messy. Well, it might, but it's more accurate. It just depends on what the customer wants. If you want the contours based on three to four points per meter or greater, then use LIDAR contours. If you want the points based on every 20 feet, then the cartographic contours are what you're looking for. You're able to provide a digital elevation model, the digital terrain model, and in those two, you just need to get together with the, uh, the person that you're working with to make sure that your definition of a DEM and a DTM are the same thing to make sure that you're both speaking the same language. According to Dave Mountie from Dewberry and Davis, a digital elevation model would be collected with LIDAR. The DTM would be LIDAR over top of photo. It's a little bit more expensive to do that but it's also more accurate, and it just depends on the assessment that you're looking to, to provide. We're able to do right-of-way mapping for a pipeline. Most of the time when they do a pipeline, there's also a pipeline underneath a power line. You can get multiple views of LIDAR. You can look at just the raw data point set. You're able to look at the TIN. You're able to look at a color-coded evaluation. And then there's another thing where you can actually take the RGB value of the imagery and drape it over the LIDAR to get, sometimes it's called pixel scooping. You know, it just has a bunch of different names. Some people call it colored LIDAR, um, but it's a really neat thing to be able to see. You can look at things or the point clouds in a profile where you've just got the raw data points, or you can put the colored point count, um, count measured by height, um, typically, just for visual effect. You can look at a full feature imagery. You can look at a bare earth, and then you can add contours to that. With the contours, you can even change the contours every five contours so you're able to detect what they are. We're able to fly power lines. So you can look at the catenaries, the line sag, the point of attachment. You can do a weather assessment. You can look at the underbuild, the wire crossing, or a danger tree analysis so that if the power company is willing to tell me how much power they're running through their line, then based on that power and the sag of the line, I could tell them either how much more power they can run through safely or if they're at a point of being in a danger of a brownout because they're running too much power based on the sag of the line. We can also tell them if they're in or out of NERC compliancy um, by doing a danger tree analysis. And a lot of people will say, well, I'm not sure that I have LIDAR in my budget. Well, if you don't have LIDAR in your budget, please don't tell me that you have the ability to pay the million-dollar fine that NERC could be assessing against you if you're out of compliancy. In 3D urban modeling, I can just look at the raw data. I could take out all the, the raw data, take off the rooftops, so all I'm looking at are the buildings. For infrastructure planning within a city, you can look at building footprints, the elevation data. We can look at roadways, waterways, any kind of utility routing, the easements. If there's a telecommunication model, we can look at that parks and recreation planning. All of these things will work for that infrastructure planning if there's an assessment that they need for emergency preparedness. 
LiDAR provides the what if, so you know that you can run models typically when you see on the, uh, the weather, it's based on a LiDAR assessment where they can show the first place that gets water will be typically the last place that loses water on a flood for a, a hurricane or a heavy storm. In telecommunication planning, we can look at the network planning, the model integration. We can also look at line of sight, link margin analyst, and then look at the footprint and the elevation data. For defense and security purposes, you're able to do literally a fly-through, and you can look for a sniper points to be able to detect where there may be advantageous uh, places for really unscrupulous people. With that defense and security, you can do a disaster response with LIDAR, again, providing the what if. You can do a damage assessment. If a bomb went off here, this would be the damage. These are the buildings that would be affected. These are the routes that we would make, need to make. This is where the debris would fall. In transportation and planning, you're able to work through a civil engineering plan. You can do the corridor planning, right-of-way studies. You can do any kind of auditing, um, inventory and maintenance. You can do waterway development and airport planning. With LIDAR, you can combine the airborne LIDAR with mobile LIDAR. So you fuse the two data sets together to get the best of both worlds. You can look at a 3D road bed center line. You can look at it in a 2D view or a 3D view for modeling purposes. You can look at engineering profile drawings through the LIDAR. Now, LIDAR gives a great assessment of what's going on, but LIDAR is not going to be able to provide a leak detection. There are technologies available that, that do that. We have a partner that can do leak detection. They can do the ground penetrating radar if the company doesn't have a geopig. Uh, this company, Entech Engineering, has a couple of different methods, and you can fuse their data set with what we would give in our LIDAR. We're able to look at the ortho photos, we can collect the photos at the same time we collect um, LIDAR, if that's possible. Otherwise, we would just come back at the opportune time to take the photo. We just fuse the data sets together and make the mosaic in this pipeline corridor. Instead of handing you 500 pictures, we give it to you all in a seamless integration. A lot of things that can't be seen from photo, can be seen in LIDAR. I worked with a company that wanted to build a chemical or a power plant in the Pacific Northwest. The area was flown with LIDAR and they actually found a fault scarp where they were going to build this chemical or power plant. They didn't build it, but if they wouldn't have that knowledge and they would have built that, the danger to the people in the environment and the hazards that it could have created would have just been immense. With LIDAR, we're able to collect a surface model and then assist with a depth of cover analysis. So either by using the uh, ground penetrating radar or using LIDAR and then running a geopig or some kind of mapping tool through the pipeline, the pipeline has to be a minimum of five feet underground. So you're going to be able to detect that very quickly um, in an assessment. You're able to do a volumetric study. This particular image is a landfill in Harris County, Texas. You look at the raw surface, do the digital terrain model surface, do a differentiation of the surface, and you're able to come up with your uh, volumetric study. You can do the same thing in oil sands. I worked with a company in Los Angeles where the construction company was saying, this is our bill. The company said, um, you move dirt, but we've got pictures, and you didn't move anything in the area that we moved it in. 
they said, well, you've got pictures to the right, we're to the left, so you still have to pay us. With LiDAR, if we flew it um, every couple of weeks, we'd be able to do an assessment that would give you an exact representation of what you're looking for. LiDAR is able to provide the cut and fill on a project in an oil and gas pipeline or any kind of area where you're working remotely. LiDAR can provide the areas to show you, this is where I would put my helipad for oil landing in case I needed to do whatever I needed to do. You can also do earth removal calculations. If you know that it's $1,000 a truckload and you have 100 truckloads to move dirt, with LiDAR, you're able to do the assessment and find out, well, it's really 200 truckloads. Because some people will say, well, I'm not sure I have LiDAR in my budget. Well, if you didn't have LiDAR in your budget, then please don't try and convince me you had the extra 100 truckloads in your budget. LiDAR is going to be able to provide that what if. We're able to be able to fly over an area for landslide hazard identification to be able to see where ground could move and if the ground did move, where it would move and how it would move, the area that it would move to and what would be affected by that. In forestry, there's a lot of applications that can be used. We can either take all the trees away and just to get a bare earth model, or if we fly the areas over time, then we're able to detect old and new growth. The same thing would hold true if you're flying over levees. Um, fly the levee this year and then next year, then the next year, and then you're able to detect if that levee is moving they would have had this in New Orleans, they may not have had as much of an issue when the hurricane hit. A lot of people want to know, well, Chuck, why should I choose aerial services? Well, we're a provider that is going to exceed your expectations. We work with you from start to finish. The first thing we do after a contract sign is to be able to work a kickoff meeting with our project managers so you're able to describe exactly in detail what you need to make sure that the people are working on the data are going to provide exactly what you need. But we're going to give you help when you need it. When we'll be able to ask you the questions, answer them, ascertain what your needs are to do that needs analysis to provide what you're looking for. We solve current problems through uh, technology, but technology changes. So a technology will evolve, and as it does, so will aerial services. We often say that we work by a Midwestern work ethic. That just means that we're going to provide you exactly what you're looking for. We'll guarantee 100% of our data. So if you're not happy with it, a contract can read. You have to be 95% accurate. We're not going to allow you to find an area where there's an error and then say, well, that's in the 5% I'm allowed to. So you have to pay me. Now we're going to go back, and even if we have to do it on our dime, we're going to take care of you. There's got to be something said about a handshake, a look in the eye, and somebody's word. What we're able to do, the equipment we use, we're able to do four color, color infrared, black and white. We have the Leica ADS-80. We have two of them. We can do conventional photography with black and white, color negative, color positive, color infrared. Um, we can do the LiDAR using our Regal VQ480. We're also adding to our arsenal a, a Planix DSS 439 camera, so we'll be able to mount them in the same hall using the same IMU to be able to collect at the same time. Then we are processing. We can do the traditional photogrammetric we can do the LiDAR data and give you 3D modeling. This is our team. I'd just like to thank everybody. We appreciate your time for uh, coming to this webinar to listen to us. I really de do need you, so do not hesitate to call me. This is my contact information. Anything that I can uh, do to provide with you, uh, please let me. And now I'd like to take the seminar and hand it back over to Josh. Josh, are you there? 
Thanks, Chuck. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, appreciate your talk. Uh, great event. And uh, always learn something new listening to you, Chuck. So thank you very much. And I think our, our attendees uh, would say the same, even though uh, they're uh, a voiceless community on the internet right now. Thank you. Um, so we do have some questions that came in during the session. So I'm going to just move right into those, uh, Chuck, if that's OK with you. Absolutely. Great. So um, I guess we'll start out. There was uh, a question about software. And, and uh, there was actually a few that had to do with software. Um, what kind of softwares do Aero Services or other companies like us use to process the, soft, the, the data and then uh, and view the unprocessed imagery uh, and, and LiDAR data? And then I guess kind of an extension of that, uh, another question was asking more about how people use that LiDAR data um, kind of as an end user perspective, what kind of softwares and tools that might be useful. Uh, some names that were thrown out were Global Mapper, uh, Map Info, et cetera. Uh, can you speak to that? Um, when we collect the data, we fly a mission. Then we're able to take the data and we process it on, for every hour of flight, it takes us about 30 minutes to post-process it um, using the Regal software to get it into a calibrated point cloud. Then we'll take that raw data and put it into a LiDAR mapping software, one of the Terra model suites, um, typically TerraScan, or we can use something like Topo DOT, um, and then process the information from there. Um, we can save it in either a text file, and you can incorporate that into your workflow. You can use um, products like um, Civil 3D to be able to. We can save in file extensions and a DWG or, um, file format. There's a number of different mapping formats that we can save. We can work in ArcGIS. Um, so there's just a ton of different softwares that we're able to provide. Uh, or we don't provide the software, but output that you can use into the software that you already have. But that's a great question. Are there any other questions? Uh, Chuck, we also had a question on uh, related to forestry. Um, can LIDAR calculate carbon stocks in a forest? I know that we can do the tree height. We can look at old growth versus new growth and do a differentiation. Some of the characteristics of LIDAR, we're able to determine what kind of trees they are. But as far as the carbon stock, I'm not real sure. I can. That's a great question, though, and we can write that down, talk with our experts, and get back with you. Just make sure that we've got your email. Yeah, we, we have uh, the contact information here. Appreciate the, the question there. Another question, uh, Chuck, we have from the audience is, how can LIDAR improve watershed delineation? So uh, water-oriented uh, hydrology type usages. I've worked with a company in the past that did a project with a Department of Water Resource um, entity. By looking at what the ground exists now and the layout of the ground, doing the topography on it, you can get where water flows. You can do assessments if a flood were to take place, where that flood's going to hit first in an area. Once you know the areas that are going to build up first, you'll know the areas that flood. After you know the areas that flood, you'll also know um, what areas are going to have water in it uh, at least. So if, if you do an assessment of taking waters up 
two inches at a time, you'll be able to determine those kind of flooding areas where you're prone to flood. The problem is a lot of city entities and their flood map that they have, I, I've worked with one city that didn't take into account the elliptical curvature of the earth. So they tried to tell us that the, uh, the LIDAR survey was wrong. Well, after we convinced them that the LIDAR area was right, then they were kind of skeptical of changing their flood mapping based on the current data that they had because they didn't want to affect their constituency. So you just have to determine how accurate you want the data to be because LIDAR can provide a very, very accurate data set. I mean, we're talking about something that can be anywhere from one inch or greater accuracy. In our LIDAR sensor, we're able to fly anywhere from 20 to 40 points per meter. Other airborne sensors are only able to do at best three to four points per meter, and that's using one foot contours. So the technology has evolved, and what we're able to provide has changed based on just that, that technology itself. Chuck, could you speak to the uh, question of, and you mentioned in your, in your talk after this question was actually asked, but uh, the uh, simultaneous acquisition of ortho and LIDAR data together. You mentioned it. Uh, it's possible. It's, it's done often. Uh, but what would be the situations that that would be possible or would not be possible? Well, with um, aerial photography, you're limited. You have to fly between 10 and 2 o'clock. And if you can fly between 10 and 2 o'clock, to get the uh, proper sun angle, the LIDAR unit and the camera are using the same IMU and the same GPS, so that signal can all tie into each other, and then you can collect at the same time, which would reduce your overall cost because you don't have to fly a, uh, a second pass for the photography. The big issue that you run into is, is the weather and the sun angle. But a lot of times you can fly a mission with LIDAR and photo, and then later that afternoon fly LIDAR by itself so you can reduce your overall cost by sometimes up to 50% or more. We had a follow-up on, you were speaking to our partners and the ability to do leak uh, detection. Could you uh, perhaps explain that a little further? We had a question as to what exactly that was, um, what that application might be. Um, can, you, can you go back to that and just kind of reiterate what that was about? Sure. Um, you would either run a, a geopig through the line, but what it, not every... Can, can you clarify what the geopig is? It's a, a GPS device that they would actually run through the, uh, the pipeline to determine where it is at any given moment. If they don't have the ability to run a geopig, they still need something that would be able to ascertain the So the, um, the ground penetrating radar would actually penetrate the ground, detect where the... Uh, the pipe is, and then that can also, a geopig can't determine any kind of leaks. The ground penetrating radar is able to pick up a leak detection, so if there are any problems with, um, with spill or leakage, that kind of technology would be able to geo-reference it and tell you exactly where those problems are. Great. So Chuck, um, you, you gave a bunch of examples as to location or types of applications that might uh, use LIDAR. Uh, what are some of the more popular applications and, and where, do you, um, uh, where do you find the, that the, the most interesting projects are being done with LIDAR? 
I'm the director of business development. I think every project's interesting. But in using flood mapping projects um, that save an entire city, I think those are just incredible. I think that the things that you can do in oil sands and mining are pretty significant. I've worked with other companies that had um, oil in, in these large vats, and they wanted us to be able to fly over it every day, finding out the best solution for this company, because oil itself is a non-reflective surface, but because the walls are a reflective surface, I would know exactly where the oil was based on where I couldn't see any deeper and where it may not be reflective, but I know that the surface isn't going down any deeper. Um, being able to fly power lines and determining the danger tree analysis. What actually happened in 2007 was just a random tree fell into a random power line and there was a brownout in the entire East Coast. So being able to prevent that by LIDAR providing the what if, it's a really great assessment of the, what the technology can do. The Texas Medical Center had research and development in the first two floors and power in the basement. Well, if they would have been able to fly LIDAR in that, they would have been able to determine for flood studies what would have happened. So the power outage happened because the power was in the basement. The research and development, they lost billions of dollars, but now through some other assessments that they've done, they've been able to move the power to other floors and the research and development to other floors as to not affect those things that can't be replaced. So LIDAR is able to provide the ability to save time, save money, but in some cases it also saves lives. Very cool. Get some more questions coming in and please feel free to add a few more. We do have a few more minutes available here uh, that we can keep the line open to have questions. So feel free to add more questions if you do still have them and are hanging with us. Um, so you were speaking to um, the large uh, flood events there uh, at the beginning of that last answer, Chuck. Uh, while you were asking that, uh, answering that question, there was a question asked as far as uh, what the final delivery of products are uh, and also the reporting that would come with it. This question uh, specifically is asking about FEMA regulations and specifications um, and how is that held, handled in the LIDAR uh, profession generally. Uh, and uh, is it accepted, uh, the reporting that we provide accepted to uh, meet those classifications and specifications? There are some specific things that need to be done, but um, if LIDAR is collected correctly and with the FEMA regulations in mind, it does meet um, FEMA specifications. It just depends on the provider um, and working out what you're trying to to determine and assess. But LIDAR, like I said, is a great tool. If you follow the rules, then it's a great tool. If you try and cheat, cut corners, then it's not such a great tool. And then people that have tried to use it when they've gotten cheated, um, the technology can get a bad name. That's why we're very, very stringent on what we do and how we collect because we're not looking at just trying to do one project with you and never work with you again. It's our goal to make you a satisfied customer. I want to be a resource for you. And in and of that, um, I can come to your office and do this kind of webinar to talk to more people in your office um, doing a, a lunch and learn. I can do this type of environment for a webinar just for your company. All you have to do is contact me at the address I provided, email address or phone number. Um, it's cboyer at aerialservicesinc.com or my cell number is 281-733-1992.
All right, Chuck. Um, another question that's come in is with regards to uh, when you do get the derived data from LIDAR, uh, what would have to be done to that data? Uh, I think they're speaking to um, uh, the, the classification work that would need to be done to that data to get accurate water flow type information from bridges or culverts, um, other uh, watershed type elements that uh, to, to get proper information out of that kind of hydrology information. What has to happen to the LIDAR data to make that possible? We would collect the data, we would classify, or we would get a, a raw calibrated point cloud and then classify the data. Classifying the data is basically putting it into a file so you can turn things off and on. It's like an onion. Um, and then you peel back what you need when you need it. Um, and then there are other mapping tools that you would start adding the water, um, showing a water at a two centimeter increase where the water is going to build up, the flow of the water, um, and things like that. Excellent. So, Chuck, what would you suggest to our uh, listeners here when they're going out to perhaps get a quote on a project or trying to get more uh, details on a project, if they're not going to call you direct or you're just one of the people they might speak to, what would the questions you would have them ask to a potential provider of LIDAR data to, to make sure that they get the specifications and things that they need um, out of that project? If, if you could give us a kind of short list. I, I kind of indicated it early on in the presentation. It's real important that if you're writing an RFP or a bid spec, you don't leave anything open for interpretation. So if you're saying, I want one foot contour accuracy, you can even say that you're going to try and meet the national map accuracy standards of three-tenths of a foot. But if you allow a provider to say, OK, I can do that at one point per meter, so I'll fly really high doing a really wide swath, and I'll do it cheaper than anybody else is doing it. Are you looking for the best assessment or the cheapest assessment? Because the cheapest assessment may not be the most accurate. So you need to determine the point count that you're looking for. Um, depends on the kind of project. With our sensor, we can collect anywhere from 20 to 40 points per meter or greater, just depending, and that's in a single pass. Um, if we need to do a double pass, you need to determine whether you're doing a block or a corridor. You need to determine the swath width. You need to determine the overlap that you're looking for. Again, if, if it's wider than can be flown in one swath, the more points you have, the better it is. If you take some sensors can fly really wide, but the ends, because we're using a rotating polygon mirror, and we can do it at a 60-degree field of view. If it's using a sawtooth pattern, when the sensor goes up to the right, it has to slow down and then stop and then start up again, coming back to the center to the left, slowing down and then stopping and starting again. So the ends of the data can be bad data. And so when you're looking at overlapping bad data on top of bad data and then trimming an overlap, it just doesn't make sense to me. I'd rather get good data, use the proper field of view, do a 50% overlap because it is a forward shooting beam. That forward shooting beam isn't going to be able to detect the backside of a building if you're working in urban areas. So you just need to work with somebody that you're going to trust that's going to be a consultant to you. Um, you need to tell the uh, consultant what your budget is, because if your budget's $100,000, there's no reason for them to try and come up with a $200,000 project that you're going to automatically look and say, no, that's I don't have the money for that. So letting them know up front what they're trying to work within only enables them to provide you the best data possible for what you're trying to do. Sometimes entities um, 
state and local government, cities, things like that, they may have an agency that they work with. So if I know that I'm going to be in your area, then I'm going to start calling other people and say, look, I'm going to have a sensor in this area. But some of these entities may be able to work within each other. You may have a 10 square mile area and think that it's going to cost too much. But if you get five other people and they have five square miles that they need, 10 square miles. So if they have 10 square miles, you have 10. So now there's five people working in a 50 square mile. Um, it's economy of scale that may reduce the overall cost of the project. So you just need to work like that. Also knowing that there are other groups within your company that may need the data, it would reduce the overall cost or increase the value of the project because you don't have to send out for subsequent surveys. If that makes sense. All right, Chuck, we're almost out of time. We do have a few questions left. And uh, before I ask this last one, I'll just note to everyone that's been asking these questions, uh, we really appreciate the questions. Uh, it helps us to uh, understand where your perspectives are and, uh, and uh, allow us to get directly to the, the concerns you have. So I appreciate those. We will follow up with uh, each of you that have asked questions that have not been answered uh, individually as we, uh, as we close um, uh, the webinar here today. We'll get back with you here shortly. But we'll, have, we'll finish with this last one here. Um, it goes back to the accuracy issue, which has been a, a theme throughout the presentation and the questions. Um, give us uh, an idea, Chuck, as to how much ground truthing is undertaken for uh, a utility corridor, for instance, a transport corridor. Uh, he was just saying, for instance, like a 100-kilometer a uh, corridor. Uh, what kind of ground truthing would be applied to that? Uh, you know, what kind of physical ground points might be applied to that, that kind of thing? We're going to use GPS in the aircraft. We're going to use GPS in the ground. We're going to make sure that the GPS on the ground stays within 10 kilometers of the, uh, the aircraft. Um, we'll do control points tying into either cores or other kind of control points on the ground. We'll also um, send our people out and do and set control points. We'll do bore sighting before we fly and when we land to make sure that the unit and all the data is calibrated. Um, we take great care in the air. The pilot flies and then there's a technician in the aircraft watching the data that we're collecting. When you do, like I was saying, the 50% overlap, there's a greater margin of error if you get a wind shear and the aircraft goes off a little bit. On a 10% overlap, there's a lot less margin of error that you're able to have. And then it's very, very possible that a wind gust comes in, blows the aircraft off a little bit. You can have any kind of size, you know, but a, what would be acceptable, a, a 20 centimeter gap in flight lines um, just wouldn't be acceptable because you're paying for an accurate assessment. So you just need to be careful in, in what you're doing, how much planning. That's why our kickoff meeting is so important and so invaluable, because as the person involved in the initial um, consultancy, I take great pains to make sure that we do it right, but sometimes company language, um, colloquial terms, industry terms that I may not be familiar with, we'll just sit down and go through the contract and, and describe exactly what it is that you want so that once we start flying, we're able to provide you exactly what you need. Um, I have been involved in projects where I ask the company, are you sure you've got the computer power? Um, because they were asking for one foot contour accuracy, they were looking for um, three foot grid spacing. They just wanted the best of the best because they were a big oil company. Once we delivered the data, the oil company's computers crashed five times because the data was so feature rich that they weren't able to handle all of the data sets. Um, we were able to send a technician to deliver the data, 
And so that technician was able to basically dumb down the data. It was still better than anything that they had ever used, um, but then it could run on their computer. So it's just making sure that not only is the LIDAR what you're looking for and all of the things in the bid specs that you were looking for, but then after we provide it to you, do you possess the ability to handle the data sets? I've worked with oil and gas companies that ran on mainframe computers and wanted just the largest data set possible. When they handed the data over to an engineering company who did not run on mainframe computers, their systems crashed and they had a very difficult time of loading the data to break it up. You know, they say you eat an elephant one bite at a time, just making these data sets more usable for each individual. Those are things that you need to take into consideration when you're asking for the deliverables. Well, Chuck, uh, we've hit our hour-long allotment that we put in place. We don't want to uh, overstep our time, so I think we'll end there, although uh, we've had many great questions. We appreciate the attendance uh, today. We had a great turnout, so appreciate all you joining us from all over the country and, and the world, really. And um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, please do f fill out the survey, which will appear when you leave the webinar. Um, and uh, keep in mind, we do have two additional webinars as part of our summer series, uh, Ortho and LiDAR Accuracy, which is going to be uh, in the end of July, and UAV and Geospatial at the end of August. You can find more information and register for those at aerialservicesinc.com slash webinars. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye now. Bye, everybody.